Okay, in this tutorial, I want to talk to you about 2020 paper two, question eight, and it's all about inferential statistics. There was 70 marks going for this question in the exam, so this was the most prominent or the most significant question in the whole test. Now, in the first part of this question, we're told that uh, there's an aptitude test out of 500 marks. We're told that the average result was 280. Now again, whenever students are doing these questions, they often get confused as to whether the 280 would be mu or whether it's x bar. Remember that x bar represents the sample mean, whereas mu represents the population mean. If the question had said that the average result out of 50 people was 280, well that would have been a sample. That was the average of the 50 people. But this just said the average is 280. And the implication is that the average out of everyone who's ever taken this test has, is 280. So the average of the population is 280. The standard deviation then is 90. And we're told that if someone gets in the top 25% in this exam, then they're, then they're asked for interview later on. So in terms of a normal curve, I've drawn just a rough sketch of a normal curve. This is what it would look like. I know that these people are going to be asked back for interview. The top 25% are asked back for interview. I want to work out what is the Z score, what is the minimum Z score that would bring someone, that would allow you to be asked back for interview. The minimum Z score that you would be asked back for interview is if you were above 75% of all of the data. So I need to work out the Z score that is above 75% of all of the data. And that's the minimum Z score that would allow you to be asked back for interview. Now, if you go to your maths tables and look at your Z scores, there are the two proportions closest to 75% are 0.7486 and 0.7517. If, you, if, so, if a piece of data has a Z score of 0.67, then the Z score is 0.7486. Or in other words, it's greater than 74.86% of all of the other figures. If you have a Z score of 0.68, then that figure is greater than 75.17% of all of the other figures. I need to pick one of these. You never ever go to three decimal places, so you do not get halfway between the two. It, the maths tables only give me these values accurate to two decimal places. So I have to select either 0.67 or 0.68. You do not round to get it to three decimal places. That's not the way that the normal curve works. And in this case, the closest one is 0.67. So your inclination might certainly be to go for 0.67. You round down, because notice that this value, this number is closer to 0.75 than this value is. However, in this case, we want to include only the top 25%. If I include this value, then I'm going down a little bit and I'm lowering the standards of this aptitude test. I do not, I certainly do not want to include more than 25% of the top. So in this case, you had to actually select this value. You had to round up to ensure that you were only including people in the top 25% in this exam. So once you've selected that, to be honest, the rest of the question is relatively straightforward. So I want you to notice that based on the maths tables, we can only be so accurate here. If you were doing st inferential statistics or if you're studying this kind of thing in college, you'll have Z scores to three or four or five decimal places. But in this case, we only have Z scores to two decimal places, so we can only be so accurate. So I'm now concluding that the minimum Z score for that would allow someone to be called back for interview is 0.68. So the Z score of a person called back for interview is 0.68. I know the population mean is 280. The standard deviation is 90. So the only thing I actually don't know at the moment is X. What mark would someone actually have to guess in order to be called back for interview? So again, we'll go to our maths tables and we'll take down our formula that we've used so often in Z scores. I know that Z is equal to X minus mu divided by sigma. In the first five tutorials that we do on the website about Z scores, we're using this formula to find Z. But in the last two, or the last couple of Z score videos, we use this formula, we know Z, we're trying to find X. So that's what we're doing here. We know three of the four variables, we're simply gonna sub in and we'll get our final answer for this part of the question. 
If someone is called back for interview, their Z score is at least 0.68. And in this case, I don't know what X is, but I know the population mean is 280, and I know the standard deviation is 90. So this is basic enough algebra now. I'm gonna wipe off this diagram, I'm gonna take this up here, and I'm just gonna finish it off and find a value for X. So the maths here is quite straightforward. This is where I left you off, and at this stage, I multiply both sides by 90 to eliminate my fraction. 0.68 by 90 is 61.2. You add 280 to both sides, and you end up with X is 341.2. So in order to be in the top 25% of the people who take this test, you need to get at least 341.2 marks. However, obviously we need to round this off to the nearest whole number. And if I round down, then I'm going back into that range of people who are below the top 25%. So it might seem almost like overkill here, but again, we round up just to ensure that we're only including people in the top 25%. You cannot round down, so you round up, and your final answer is X is equal to 342 marks. In A part two, we're told that anyone who gets a mark above the 40 percentile will be called, is allowed to do the test again, or to reset the test, and hopefully do better, and then get called for interview. So, and we're told that Eileen got 260 marks. So what I've done is I've graphically illustrated my normal curve. The average result is 280, and the standard deviation is 90. Eileen has done a little bit worse than the average person who sat this test. Eileen has only got 260 marks. I need to figure out the proportion of figures in this normal curve, the proportion of people who sat the test who did worse than Eileen. If that is bigger than 40%, then happy days, Eileen can reset the test. Unfortunately, if, if, le if this figure is less than 40%, then Eileen w isn't going to be asked to reset the test because she was in the bottom 40%. So I know my, my standard deviation is 90, my population mean is 280, and Eileen's actual figure is 260. So I simply go to my maths tables and I work out and I look at my standardizing formula. In order to work out Eileen's z-score, it's 260 minus 280 over 90. That works out as minus 0 0.222, which means that now I don't want to think about the practical normal curve in the question. Look at the normal curve on page 36 in your maths tables. I'm trying to emulate or I'm trying to copy that now. The population mean is 0 and anything here is marked as a z-score. Eileen's z-score is minus 0 0.22. I round it to two decimal places because the maths tables on page 36 and 37, all of the z-scores are to two decimal places. I don't have access to information that allows me to be so accurate as to go to three decimal places. So you just round it to two decimal places. This is Eileen's z-score. So I want to work out the proportion of figures in a normal curve that are less than minus 0 0.22. I want to work out the probability z is less than or equal to minus 0 0.22. Remember all of the stuff we did on z-scores in the tutorials. You can't read a negative z-score off your maths tables. Instead of less than a negative z-score, that's the same as greater than a positive z-score. In other words, the proportion of figures less than minus 0.22 is the same as the proportion of figures that are greater than plus 0.22. But I can't read greater than off my maths tables, I can only read less than. So remember that instead of greater than a z-score, it's 1 minus less than the z-score. And again, it's important that you write out your inequalities like that. So if you're not 100%, go back over the first few tutorials we did on z-scores. It's very straightforward, but it's important you get your terminology right. And I can read this off my maths tables. Less than a positive z-score, happy days, that's the only thing I can read off my maths tables. According to your maths tables, the proportion of figures less than 0.22 is 0 0.5871. So one minus this figure will give me the proportion of figures less than minus 0.22. And if you plug this into your calculator, you get 0 0.4129. That is the proportion of people who sat this test and did worse than I need. If I was to turn this into a percentage, I'd multiply by 100, and it would be 41.29%. So 41.29% of people who sat this test did worse than Eileen. What I can conclude from this 
is that Eileen is not in the lower 40% of people. She is above the 40 percentile. So happy days, Eileen has just about made the cut. Eileen will be allowed to reset this test. So just to be sure to be sure, I would finish it off like this. 0.4129 is greater than 0.4, so Eileen can reset the test. In B part one, we're asked to explain the relevance of minus 1.96 and plus 1.96 in a standard normal distribution. Again, go back to almost everything we did about confidence intervals, hypothesis tests, or margins of error, or a number of the videos we did on z-scores. In a number of the videos we did on z-scores, we calculated things. One specific question we did was we worked out the proportion of figures in a normal curve between 1.96 and minus 1.96. When you work that out, the proportion of figures in any normal curve that lie within 1.96 standard deviations of the mean is 95%. So to get the full marks here, all you need to do is say 95% of all of the data in a normal curve lies within this interval, between one, minus 1.96 and plus 1.96. Or again, a graph like that very accurately illustrates what I'm trying to say. So maybe just to find it with a graph would have been useful as well. Okay, in B part two, we're told that 2,500 people were surveyed about whether or not they would use a new service. And we're told that the radius of the confidence interval was 0 0.01568. The radius of a confidence interval is another way of saying the margin of error. The radius is, you add the radius on, you subtract the radius, and that gives you your confidence interval. Just like you add the margin of error, you subtract the margin of error. So if you're not 100% on where I'm getting this, or if you're not 100% on how I started off, Rewatch the tutorial on margin of error from the website. Now it's relatively straightforward when you're getting the margin of error for proportion. Remember when we're dealing with proportion there's very few variables. P hat represents the proportion of people in the survey who said that they would like to use this service. Whereas P represents hypothetically if I asked every, everyone in the world whether they would like to use this service or not the proportion of people who would, would be the P. Remember that technically it's impossible for us to actually work out P. We use P hat as a general guideline for what P might actually be. What you need to recognize is that when we're dealing with proportion, the margin of error is 1.96 multiplied by the standard error. And you can get the standard error on page 35 in your maths tables. The standard error for proportion is the square root of P hat times one minus p hat over n. If we knew what p the proportion was, we would use p here. And you can see in your maths tables on page 34 that they actually use p rather than p hat. However, whenever we don't have access to p, the actual proportion, we use p hat instead as a general guide, as a general guideline for what p might actually be. So I, in a long-winded way, this is the margin of error for proportion. And I've been told in the question, the margin of error for this proportion is 0 0.01568. And I know that N is 2,500. So if you look at this equation now, I've got one equation and one unknown, which means I can find a value for P hat. So the maths is easy enough here. The first thing I decided to do was to divide both sides by 1.96. If you divide the left by 1.96, you just have the third. This figure divided by 1.96 is 0 0.008. I then square both sides to eliminate the third, and I get 0 0.00064. I then multiply both sides by 2,500 to get rid of the fraction, and it's equal to 0 0.16. If you multiply p hat by 1, you get p hat. If you multiply p hat by minus p hat, you get minus p hat squared. At this stage, you have to notice you have a p hat squared, a p hat, and a number. So you have a quadratic. So you move everything to one side, I know if p hat squared minus p hat plus 0 0.16. What I'm now going to do is use the minus b formula to solve this and get two potential values for p hat. So from here it's relatively straightforward. I've got a quadratic equation, the coefficient of p hat squared is 1, the coefficient of p hat is minus 1, and the c at the end is 0 0.16. So if you use your minus b formula, the two possible values of p hat that would give me a radius or a margin of error at the, like the one we had at the start of the question is 0.8 or 0.2. However, you, know, you should notice that they said that p hat 
is greater than 0 0.5 but less than 1. So obviously we cannot include 0 0.2 because it's not less than 5. So your final answer for B part 2 is that the proportion of people who said that they would like to use this new service is 0.8 or in other words 80%. In part C of this question we're told that the average weight of carry-on luggage for this airline is 12 kilos. That's the population mean, the average of everyone who's ever flown on this airline, their average carry-on luggage was 12 kilos. That's your mu, your population mean. However, the airline introduces a fee for non-carry-on luggage. So obviously logically that means a lot of pe people are going to start putting more on their carry-on because that's there's no extra fee on that. So they introduce this new fee and then they survey 80 people. So my n is equal to 80. And they want to investigate, has the average weight of carry-on luggage increased? So the average of the 80 people was 13.1 kilos, the average weight of their carry-on. And when the standard deviation was 4.5. Now it's important you understand what's going on here. Just because the average weight of the carry-on of the 80 people surveyed, just because it's 13.1, which is admittedly higher than the population mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that if the airline had interviewed a, a different 80 people, maybe they could have interviewed a different 80 people and their average weight would have been 10.9. Maybe it, they would have been lower. We need to investigate using a hypothesis test whether the difference between the 13.1 and the 12, if it, could it be a coincidence or is it statistically significant? Like, is there such a difference there that the conclusion would be the average weight of, of carry-on luggage for the entire population has actually increased? We're asked to carry out a null uh, uh, hypothesis test, so we need to come up with our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is always that nothing has changed. So at the start of this question, we're told that the average weight of carry-on luggage is 12 kilos. So my null hypothesis is that if I surveyed everyone who, who uses this airline, the average weight would still be 12 kilos. I have to assume that the nothing has changed unless the data suggests otherwise. So the alternative hypothesis is that no, in fact, now the average weight is no longer 12 kilos. If I surveyed everyone who uses this airline, it would be the average weight of the carry-on luggage is something other than 12 kilos. Now the question has asked me to test the hypothesis at the 5% level of significance. That implies calculate a z-score for the sample mean. So you should go to the one sample z-test at the top of page 35 in your maths tables. It tells me that the z-score can be calculated as x-bar, the sample mean, minus mu, the population mean, divided by sigma, which is 4.5, over the square root of n. So in this case, this is our formula that we're getting in our maths tables. And we know x bar, we know mu, we know sigma, and we know n. So all we need to do here is simply sub in. Z in this case will be 13.1 minus 12 over 4.5 divided by the square root of 80. And I'm simply gonna plug all of this into my calculator, and I'm gonna get a value for Z. So when you plug it all into your calculator, your z-score to two decimal places works out as 2.19. Now you should immediately recognize that number is bigger than 1.96. Now, as always, when doing these questions, just to be sure to be sure, you always conclude by three different ways. So what I want to do is go through our three different conclusions here. So I'd always advise you to start with an inequality. What I, I'm mentioning here is that the 2.16 is greater than 1.96. Remember, those, the 1.96 and the minus 1.96 were the figures we're looking for. This is clearly outside that range. A graph really illustrates what's going on. If your z-score had worked out between 1.96 and minus 1.96, my conclusion would have been to fail to reject HO. If my z-score had been less than minus 1.96 or above plus 1.96, we reject HO. And then I marked in where my z-score is. It's way out here. It's 2.19. It, this clearly illustrates that the z-score we got is within the rejection zone, the reject HO zone. So therefore, I'm going to reject HO, and, I, and then you, re, you rewrite your alternative hypothesis. If you're rejecting HO, you're now concluding that the mean weight of carry-on luggage has changed. What that means from a practical sense in this question is that if you actually weighed 
every single passenger's carry-on luggage from now on, the, it would be more than 12. It's the average has increased because of the new fee that the airline have introduced. Okay, in part D, we're told that a bus has a maximum capacity of, of 3,000 kilos. We're told that the average weight of passengers is 73 kilos. Again, it doesn't say the average weight of 50 passengers is 73 kilos. It just says the average is 73. The implication being there, the average weight of every passenger who's ever going to go on, on any of these buses is 73. It's a population mean is the 73. The standard deviation is 12. And we're told that 40 people are going to get on this bus. We need to work out the probability that the 40 people are going to be too heavy for the bus. If the average weight, if the maximum capacity of the bus is 3,000 kilos and 40 people get on, 40 into 3,000 is 75 kilos. So that tells me that if everyone weighs exactly 75 kilos, then the bus will be at its maximum weight. So I'm going to work out the probability that the average weight of the 40 people is above 75 kilos. So these are my four different variables. Now, part D here is is very very similar to what we did in a part two i want you to th just have a look at a part two as well have it in the back of your mind as i go through this we have a normal curve here the average weight of people in this normal curve is 73 kilos i want to work out the probability that if i have 40 people their average weight is above 75 kilos so i want to work out the chances their average weight is above 75 kilos in A part two, we were talking about Eileen, and we wanted to know, we and Eileen was just one person. I think the average was 280, and Eileen's figure was 260. So in, in A part two, we use the standardizing formula, Z is equal to X minus mu over sigma. We use that because we were dealing with just one piece of data. We were only talking about Eileen. Here, we are not just talking about one piece of data. I don't want to know the probability that just one passenger weighs more than 75 kilos. I want to know the probability that the average weight of 40 passengers is above 75 kilos. So we don't use our standardizing formula. We go to the next page in our maths tables and we use the one standard Z test. The one, sorry, the one sample Z test on the top of page 35 it does it does what we were doing the same thing as we did in a part two except we're doing it for a sample of the data not just one piece of data so if i sub in here z works out as x bar which is 75 minus mu which is 73 divided by sigma over the square root of n or in other words divided by 12 over the square root of 40. and if you plug all of that into your calculator your z score to two decimal places works out as 1.05. So that Z score represents the chances that the average weight of the 40 people is 75 kilos. And now let's just think about page 36 in our maths tables. We now can think of this, this normal curve in a different way. I want to know the probability or the proportion of figures in any normal curve that are above 1.05. So I'm going to wipe off my Z score here and I'm going to continue this on. So this is what I'm actually looking for. I want to know the proportion of figures in a Z score greater than or equal to 1.05. You can't read greater than off your maths tables, but what you can read is 1 minus less than. So 1, I want 1 minus the probability that Z is less than or equal to 1.05. And I can just read this off my maths tables. If you go to page 37 in your maths tables, you'll be able to read this off and we'll be able to get our final value for part D. So to finish this one off, you just read this off your maths tables. The proportion of figures less than 1.05 is 0 0.8531. One minus that gives me 0 0.1469. So the probability that the 40 people are gonna to be too heavy for this bus is 14.69%. And that's your final answer for part D. In the final part of, it, of question eight, the trends of eight different numbers is described to us. We're told the median is 12 and a half, the lower quartile is seven and a half, the interquartile range is 12, the range is 21, the mean is 13.5, the second last number is 23, 
and that note that the, the smallest difference between any of the numbers is two. So each number has to be at least two more than the previous one and two less than the last one. So we just need to fill in all of the data here. Remember that the median is the average of the fifth one and the sixth one. If there are eight pieces of data, the median is here. It splits the data into two. So the median is the average of the fifth figure and the sixth figure. In this case, I know the median is 12.5. So this figure and this figure have an average of 12.5. I know that the lower quartile is halfway between the second one and the third one. Remember, the lower quartile is the median of the figures that are to the left of the actual median. There are four figures to the left of the median, so this line splits those the first four figures in two, and the average of the, of the second and third figure must be seven and a half. So the average of this one and this one has to be seven and a half. We're told the interquartile range is 12. The interquartile range is the difference between the upper quartile and the lower quartile. The lower quartile would be here. The upper quartile is the median of these four figures, which is here. So I know that the average of the second last one and the third last one has to be the, the upper quartile. But I can work out the upper quartile. If the lower quartile is seven and a half, and I add 12, that'll give me the upper quartile. So seven and a half plus 12 is 19 and a half. So I can say that the average of 23 and this number is, is 19 and a half. Now there's a couple of different ways of doing it. You could think of it as, right, that means that X plus 23 divided by two, the average of this figure and this figure must be equal to 19 and a half. And that, would allow, that equation would allow me to work out X. The way that I think about it is to go from 23 down to 19 and a half, you go down three and a half. So if you just go down three and a half again, 19.5 minus three and a half gives me 16. So the way I think of it there, so just look at that then, 16 plus three and a half is 19 and a half plus three and a half is 23. So the average of 16 and 23 gives me this figure. Although if you don't like thinking of, thinking of it like that, you can just solve this equation and you'll get 16. Now, let's have a look at the next bit. I know that the next number here, it cannot be a 15. It can't be 15 because it has to be two less than 16. So then if I want to, next thing I want to figure out is this one. Definitely cannot be a 15 because that would only be one less than 16. So based on the 16 being here, it looks like this could be a 14 or a 13. The figure here could be, 15, it could be a 14 or a 13. However, it actually can't be 13 because the, the, me, the median is 12 and a half. If this figure was a 13, then this figure would have to be a 12 because halfway between 13 and 12 is 12 and a half. However, that's not possible because if this figure was a 12 and this figure was a 13, there's only a difference of one between them. There has to be a difference of at least two between each number, between consecutive numbers. So it's impossible to have 12 and 13 in there, which means I can also rule out 13. So the figure here, it cannot be 15, it obviously can't be 16, it can't be 13, but it does have to be bigger than the median. So the only possible value here is 14. The, the fifth figure has to be 14. If that figure is a 14, then I can clearly work out what this one is. The median, 12 and a half, is the average of this value and this value. So if I refer to this one, this is my D. Again, you could use an equation. You could say that D plus 14 divided by two. In other words, the average of these two numbers is 12 and a half. And you could solve that equation and you could work out a value for D. The way that I think of it is 14, if I go down one and a half, I get to 12 and a half. So if I go down one and a half again, I get to 11. Halfway between 11 and 14 is 12 and a half. So I know that this figure is 11. Now, let's continue on and try and figure out what this one is. Let's continue on with it. We can follow the same logic as the way we worked out the 14. So if we look at the lower quartile as seven and a half. If the lower quartile is seven and a half, then maybe this would be an eight and this would be a seven. If you use eight and seven, then halfway between them, you get seven and a half. But again, we know that it can't be an eight and a seven because the difference between seven and eight is one. I need a difference of at least two between all of these figures. So if we're looking at this value here, we can definitely rule out eight. We can also definitely rule out 10, because if this was a 10, 
then it's only one less than 11 and that's not allowed either. So it's, it can't be an eight, it can't be a 10, but it has to be bigger than seven and a half. So it must be a nine. That's the only possibility. If this value is a nine and I subtract one and a half, I get to seven and a half. I subtract one and a half again and I get to six. So now the only values that I don't know are the smallest one and the biggest one. Now, the only other piece of information that I have is that the range is 21 and the mean is 13 and a half. There's a load of different ways of working out now the smallest one and the biggest one. There's a, the way that I'm going to do it is the way that I think is probably the easiest to think of. I just kind of want to use a process of elimination here. I know the range is 21. If you look, right, if that's a 23, then the smallest possible number that this could be is a 25. The smallest value this could be is a 25 because it's definitely not allowed to be a 24. If this is a 6, the smallest possible value I could have below it, 6, it can't be a 5, the smallest possible value I could have is a 4. And just coincidentally, the difference between 4 and 25 is 21. So I obviously I can't go any bigger with the smallest value and I can't go any smaller with the biggest value. So the only possible way I'm going to get a range of 21 is if I use a 4 and I use a 25. Now obviously that one seems a bit like it, it almost seems like I just made that up. So I think in an exam you might have come up with you'd come up with that conclusion. But well, now you just double check. Add up all of your figures and divide by 8. If you add up all of your figures and divide by 8, the mean works out as 13.5 and happy days, you've worked out your 8 different figures based on the data given.